Hey, I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. It's wonderful. You know, I started out. Pastor reminded me of this. You know, I told him, I said, yeah, I've been telling people that. But I find out I don't do it myself. So participants this morning, do as I say, not as I do. We're glad to have our visitors that are with us today. And I want to welcome you. Glad you can worship with us. And I also want to welcome the people that are out there looking at us and listening to us and participating in our worship service that are online this morning. We don't know where they're from. They can be anywhere around the world that may be tuned in to us. I know my family oftentimes tune in to us back in Ohio. So that's quite a little ways away. We have a few announcements this morning. Tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock to 1 p.m. is a work bee at the church. And we want to spruce our grounds up a little bit. As you know, the weeds are growing faster than the flowers. Have you noticed that? My wife's been complaining about it. We want it to look good. It's says that the conference, Oregon Conference, is going to be video on our property. Now, I don't know why they are going to be doing this, but uh, I'm sure they have a good reason. So we need you. And it's been raining outside. And that's good. We need the rain. Uh, but we need a break between 9 and 1 o'clock tomorrow. So we need to maybe pray that God will give us a dry morning tomorrow to, to work at the church. And children, what's coming up pretty quick? Vacation Bible school. Yeah, are you looking forward to that? I think you are, if you've been to them before. It starts June the 14th. And it goes from 6 to 8 p.m. For the kids that are 4 to 12 years old. Now, see this little card right here? This flyer? Those are available out in the foyer. Pick one up, pick 10 of them up, pick 20 of them up if you can use them, and invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite friends of your children. And I understand that these are gonna be going out around the neighborhood to invite our neighborhood kids. And uh, let's pray that these people won't just throw them in the garbage and they'll bring their kids to vacation Bible school. And uh, next Sabbath, Rod Zama is going to be here to speak. He's the one that's putting on our series coming up in October. You say, well, that's a long ways off. It'll be here before you know it, the way the summer's going. So I think we'll enjoy hearing what he has to say. And he'll be talking about the evangelistic meetings coming up. And the next Sabbath also will be a fellowship lunch. That is provided. It's not a potluck. And we'll be served for that. So uh, this time, Court will have some songs this morning. Good morning. It is wonderful to see you all here today. It's wonderful to be able to sing with you. I would invite you to turn to hymn number 74 in your hymnal, or you can read the words right off the screen, whichever works for you. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Number 74. Thank you. 
singing hymn number 369 369 bringing in the sheaves
time to praise God with our offerings. You know, we can praise God a lot of different ways. One of the ways we do is with our offerings. And our offerings today is going to be for church budget. A church budget covers a lot of pros, uh, things. And uh, we have a sheet just like this. It's got all the different things on our church budget. A big list of them. And they all require funding. One of them is Vacation Bible School, which we just talked about. Another one is the meetings coming up, coming up in October that we've mentioned. And then there's all the just the ordinary things that go on in the church. So if, as you think about it this morning, as the Holy Spirit impresses you, invite you to give what you are able to praise God. If the deacons would please stand. Father in heaven, we could praise you all day and not cover all the things that you need to be praised for. But we just praise your holy name this morning that you give us life and peace and that we can give back some of what you have blessed us with. Please take this money. May it go to shine a light in this part of our world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, children, it's been a long time since we've had a children's story for you. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and we're going to have a children's story. So we would invite you to come up front, and uh, they're going over on this side by the organ. Okay, and so come up front, children. You're not used to coming up, are you? It's you. Yeah. You can we're come. Gonna, we'll do something different. Come we're going to miss Mrs. Steps. Carpenter. Those of you that are used to us sitting on this pew, some grown-ups took your pew. <laughs> that we've, it's been a while since we've been having, able to have the children's story, but when you're used to a routine, Josiah was asking me, Mom, there's people sitting on the pew where we're supposed to sit. So we'll do it a little different. Sit on the steps. Good morning. I was so excited when the pastor called and said he was going to put the children's story back. And he asked me to tell the story. And then I started thinking about all the books that I have packed up to refresh my mind on some of the stories I might have wanted to tell. But Jesus helped me find a story. And it's about a boy named Jerry who lived in Africa on a mission compound. And all the boys at the mission compound had planted gardens. Does anyone have a garden planted at home? Yeah? What's something that you have to do to keep your garden nice? You have to water, but Remy's got it. Weed. So Jerry, he worked very hard at taking care of his part of the garden because every year the superintendent of the mission compound would come and he would pick out who had the best kept garden. And so Jerry, he wanted to win this year. He wanted to win the prize. And so he worked really, really hard with his garden. And he had watered it. And he had kept all the weeds because, do you know what, in West Africa where he lived, the weeds grow even faster than they grow here in Oregon. And so he worked really hard to keep his garden just the best he could so that by the end, when it came time for the, the superintendent to judge who had the best one, Jerry just knew his was going to win this year. And then something happened. Jerry was out working in his garden, and he started to get a terrible headache. And he started to feel worse and worse and worse and worse. And he went and he saw the nurse, and the nurse sent him over to the mission hospital because Jerry was very, very sick, and he had a high fever, and he had to be in bed, and he had to stay there for two or three weeks. He was so sick. 
And while he was laying in bed, do you know what he was thinking about? His garden. And I don't know about the rest of you kids, but I have a boy who has an overactive imagination. And he probably would have done the same thing Jerry did. Jerry laid in bed, and all in his mind, all he could see was the weeds growing and growing and growing into his garden. And he just knew that his garden was overrun with weeds. And that made him feel sad. And it was harder to get well because he was so sad. Because the Bible says a joyful heart does good like a medicine. And he had a sad heart. And so it just, oh, he just felt worse and worse and worse. But what Jerry didn't know was that his good friend Daniel was out there all that time. And he looked at Jerry's garden and he said, you know what, Jerry has worked so hard on his garden. It's just not fair to let the weeds grow. And so he got all of his friends together and they talked about it. And they all decided, well, all of them, they wanted to win the prize too, that each of them would take a little bit of time each day and take a little section of Jerry's garden and keep the weeds pulled up and to water and make, things were, make sure things were nice. So then the day of the inspection came, and Jerry was laying in bed, and all he could see in his mind were weeds, 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 and he just knew it. Then all of a sudden, the door opened, and in came the superintendent and all of his friends. And his, Jerry said, why are you here? He said, well, I came to congratulate the, the one who had the best garden, and that's you, Jerry. Jerry said, no, it's not. My garden is full of weeds. And the superintendent said, well, there wasn't full of weeds when I went and looked out at the gardens this morning and saw that yours looked the best. And Jerry was like, what? What happened? And the superintendent said, well, I think your friends might know. And, and Daniel, he said, I guess God just kept the weeds out of your garden. And the superintendent said, I think God used some hands of some humans to help keep the weeds out of the garden. So do you think this week that you could be God's hands, just like Daniel and his friends were God's hands for Jerry? Maybe it's not pulling weeds, but maybe it's doing kind things for mommy, helping to put things away, helping to do the dishes. See, let's see this week, find which ways that you can be God's hands. And you can come tell me in Sabbath school next Sabbath how you were able to be God's hands this week. Okay, you can go sit quietly back at your seats. Judy Taylor. Don't laugh at me, it's not funny. Judy Taylor has our scripture this morning, and that will be followed by our prayer by Kyle Cothran, and then Geraldine Denser will have our special music after that. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture this morning is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 to through 25. So that was in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, this wonderful day that we have to spend time with each other as a family, to spend time with you. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath, this day that you have set apart for us to spend time with you. It is such a privilege. Father, I pray that this day would not get lost on routine, but that we would realize how much you love us. Father, the fact that you, the King, the Creator, 
has set aside this day so that we can get to know you and that you can get to know us is just incredible. It makes me want to shy away because I know that I don't deserve it, Father. But you don't, that's, I am more important to you than what I deserve. And we thank you so much for the love that you've given us. Father, may us be here, be a representation of how much we love you and that we care about you, Father. I pray that you would bless the pastor's words, that we may get to know your love on a new level today. Father, be with all of those who are hurting. You know this world is on the brink of disaster and that it is being held together by strings, and we can see that in every direction. But we know that you are here with us, and we pray that you would be with those who are hurting now. Father, uh, bless this day. We love you, and we pray. Amen. I especially appreciated in Kyle's prayer that we get what we don't deserve. The Sabbath is such a blessing. And you know, we've had three deaths recently in our church family. And I have to say what a blessing that Grandpa was with us for. Almost 99 years. We sometimes get what we don't deserve. And you know, the beauty of it is, regardless of who we are, what our life has been, what our sins have been, God is anxious to write our name in the book of life in heaven. The pastor will be speaking of the sower, the different soils, the responses that we can have. But the main thing is the sawyer is the sower sows in every type of dirt, rock, gravel. God wants to write your name. Let's be sure that we are there so we can meet our family again in the resurrection. Is your name written? 
So much for those words of song this morning. And to have our children back as part of our worship service. Amen. Amen. Yes. Children's story is back. And Vacation Bible School is back this year. I hope you invite some neighbors and friends starting Monday at 6 o'clock on in a couple of Mondays on June the 14th. So we're looking forward to that. Will you bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer today, as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. We thank you so much for your word that's written. We ask that our name would be written there on that page, white and fair, in the book of thy kingdom. Lord, I just pray that your word would be with us today. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. It is in his name that we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. The sower, seeds, and soils. This is the season that I think about this because all around I, where I look, you see evidence of this. Do you? Evidence of growth evidence of planting. Those who have been working so hard in their greenhouses, getting those seedlings ready to go into the ground. And you know who you are. Those of you out here who are the green thumbs, we know who you are. <laughs> I'm not so much that. My wife is more of a green thumb than I. She's always saying, but I need to get ready. We need to rototill the ground. We need to get the soil ready. We need to plant. It's the time for growth. I know some of you are out there in your gardens. I've heard about them, haven't seen all of them yet. Hope to see some of them. But these are amazing. We see the evidences of growth all around us as we're involved in planting gardens and crops. I was there just uh, recently this week and a picture similar to this right outside of the school grounds, CVCS, this beautiful green of crop that's growing. If you go by our school, you can see it there. Amazing, vivid, green, surrounding fields. You look all around us. The evidence of growth, the sower, seeds, and soils. Thinking about planting, thinking about seeds and soils reminds me of the life of Jesus. The parables of Jesus, where Jesus is comparing our lives and our hearts to various types of ground in which seed is sown. 
From a parable, we learn the conditions that must be right. God's word to provide and to produce a harvest in our lives. Therefore, we must properly cultivate our hearts and ensure that the right conditions are present. Hope you have your Bibles with you. They'll also be on screen. But we're looking at the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke this morning. The Gospel of Matthew, rather. Why is that Luke? Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. As we read these words. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. And others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's amazing, as I read these words this week, I'm reminded also of the last church in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is walking among, amidst his church, and he's giving messages to them. And at the end of those messages, he says these words, He who has an ear, let him hear. The same words used in this parable, in this gospel of Matthew, are also mentioned in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. What is a parable anyway? Why did Jesus teach in parables? He spoke many things to them this way. The Gospels record that some 60 different parables Jesus is mentioning, found in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What is a parable anyway? A parable is to place alongside of something, an illustration alongside something, to illustrate a truth. Remember, uh, a while back, we spoke of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to bring revival in our lives. And we talked about him in these words. What is he known as? The paraclete, the parakletos, the one who is called alongside to help. We thought of other English words like the parachute. The parachute comes alongside us. Isn't that right? Hopefully, as they plunge down through the sky, the parable, the parachute. An earthly story illustrating a heavenly meaning or a spiritual truth. Jesus spoke in parables. So why teach in parables? The disciples asked the same question. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Notice what Jesus responds. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries, to know what? The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be, what? Taken away from him. So Jesus says himself that there are two reasons that I teach in parables. What were they? To reveal and to conceal. 
to reveal the truth to those who have accepted him and to conceal the truth from those who have rejected him. The principle applies to us today, does it not? If you and I respond positively to the gospel, to do and to follow the light that God has given to us, then God will give us more light. Can you say amen? God wants to do that in our lives. But if we reject the light, he will not give us any more light if we fail to use the light that he has already given. Doesn't that make sense? If you fail to step into the light that God shows before you, before me, before us, no more will be offered. But if we obey the truth that we know, God will share more truth with us. But if we don't follow it, then why would God give us more? The general theme of Jesus' parables is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And if you look at them, you find over and over, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. In explaining why he spoke in parables, Jesus made references over and over to these, this mystery. God's word can indeed come and help to clear up much of the fog in our lives as we understand God's intent in establishing his kingdom in our lives. Not the kingdom of this earth, but the kingdom of heaven. We see it in Jesus' itinerant ministry. Over and over, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says in other places, he preached, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is also says the same idea. In Matthew 5 through chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Over and over, later on, he says, Those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes, the preaching of the gospel, the Lord's Prayer says, Your kingdom, what? Come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's Prayer. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so the whole chapter of Matthew 13 is composed of parables about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. But you see, we must look at this morning three elements here in the parable of Jesus. What are these three elements? There are the seeds, there is the sower, and there is the soils. The parable drew upon the rich agricultural image of which the people that Jesus was speaking to were so very familiar with. A man in the Middle East with the seed bag tied to his waist, walking along his field and rhythmically casting out the seed, rhythmically broadcasting the seed as he's going along. Consider the power of just one little seed. If I were to hold a few of these seeds in my hand, recognize the power of just one seed, my friends. If the word of God would be preached to only a few, that seed can spread and reproduce and be fruitful for years and years to come. Amen? Amen. The seed is the word of God carried around the world, online, if you will, by the power of the word of God. The Bible says these words, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. 
Not long ago, they found a seed deep within a pyramid in Egypt. That seed was estimated to be some 3,000 years old. Just for the fun of it, they decided to take that seed and plant it to see if it would grow and reproduce. And guess what? It did after thousands of years. The Bible, you see, is the seed. And it is amazing to understand its potential that God has promised that his word will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish the thing whereto he sent it. God will use his word in a mighty way. The book of Psalms records, they that sow in tears will reap in joy. Are we going around, my friends, proclaiming the word of God? Are we broadcasting the seed of truth to all whom we come in contact with? And many times it is a work that causes sorrow because not all are receptive to that message of truth. And yet we're to do it, my friends, because ultimately it will end in joy if we sow in tears the burden of souls in our hearts. Why isn't everyone saved? Is there a problem with the seed? Absolutely not. We know for sure that the problem is not with the seed. But there is another question. Is there a problem with the sower? The Bible said, he who sows the good seed, who is that? The son of God. Jesus is the sower. What did he do right? Jesus sowed the seed. He planted, he sowed, but what did he sow? He sows the gospel contained in the word of God. He sowed the good news of the gospel. And the Bible says, in due time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Farmers don't plant on Monday and expect to reap on the same day or even the next week. We need to let God do his work as we cooperate with him in the work of sowing the seed and in seeing the results that will bear fruit to his honor and glory. Amen. In this parable, no problem with the sower, no problem with the seed. So the problem has to be with the soil. In this parable, Jesus speaks of how many different kinds of soils? Four types of soil. We find here in this passage, we go back to it again. And as he sowed some seed fell by the wayside, this is verse four, and the birds came and devoured them. You see, the farmer's field in ancient Palestine was long, narrow strips of serpentine land, pieces of land, which became beaten and hard as pavement by the feet and the hooves and the wheels that were going on them over and over and over again. The seed merely bounced on these paths and were swept back and forth by the wind. And so the disciples came to him and were asking him the deeper meaning of this parable. And later in the chapter, Jesus actually goes to his disciples and he shares with them more graphically the specific meaning of this statement, the wayside. He says later on in this chapter, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. The indifferent heart, the hard heart, the hardened heart. You see, my friends, some are like that soil. There are those around us who have so hardened their hearts that it will not allow the seed of the word of God to take root. Our garden each spring, especially when we lived in Montana and other places where we had a larger area, my wife would say, 
Honey, it's time to get out the rototiller. It's time to work up that hard, hardened ground that had stood idle through those hard winter months. Some people are like that wayside soil. They have the hardened hearts. They need to allow the word of God to somehow rototill the soil of their hearts and to get it worked up. There are places to plant the seed and there are places that are hard where the seed doesn't easily take root. You know, friends, we need to pray for people. We ought never to give up on people who have hard hearts. Never give up on them, amen? For God can break up the soil and perhaps a seed can get into a small crack sometime. Some won't look up until they're flat on the back. Some hard circumstances confronting them to somehow get their attention. Their heart has become hardened. And the Bible says here in this parable that the birds came along and ate it up. Symbolize what the evil one, the devil, wants to do in the lives of people. So that those seeds of truth do not have an opportunity to take root. Well, there's a second type of soil that's mentioned here in this parable. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. In Palestine, much of the land is covered with this thin veneer of soil over lime, limestone rock. God wants to do something. He wants to take this soil of this impulsive heart, pictured here as the stony ground, totally different from the wayside path. You see, it's not on the surface. There's just a little soil there, and the soil is not very deep. For you see, there's rocks beneath. The soil doesn't, isn't deep. So the seed springs up quickly, but it has no root system and ultimately dries up and withers away. Stony hearts. Impulsive decisions. Actually making a profession of faith, but with no depth. Maybe it's an emotional, impulsive decision, but there is no depth of root. The seed of God, the word of God hasn't gotten very deep. So it says that the sun comes along and withers it away. Circumstances, problems, hardships. But we must persevere in the face of difficulties. Some come to God today thinking that when they do, somehow their problems will simply go away. But we need to have deeper roots. There was a 10-year-old boy who understood this, had this principle applied in his life. The seed in the stony places the one who hears the word of God immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So this young man, a 10-year-old boy, decides to study judo, despite the fact that he had lost his left arm in a devastating car crash. The boy began his lessons with an old Japanese judo master as he went along taking these lessons from his master the boy was doing well he couldn't understand why after three months of training the master had only taught him one single move in judo sensei the boy finally said calling his master sensei shouldn't i be learning more moves this is the only one you know, but this is the only move that you will ever need to know, the master told the young man. Not quite understanding this young man, but believing his teacher, the boy kept on his training. Several months later, 
the sense he took the boy to his first tournament. Surprisingly, the boy easily won the first two matches. The third match proved to be more difficult, but after some time, his opponent became impatient and charged toward the young man. The boy immediately deftly used the one move that a master had taught him, and he won the match. Still amazed by the process, the success, the boy was now in the finals of these championships. The opponent was bigger and stronger this time, more experienced. For a while, the boy seemed to be overmatched, overpowered, and concerned that the boy might get hurt. The referee calls out, time out. He was about to call the match to an end when the master, the sensei, intervened and said, no, let him continue. Soon after the match resumed, his opponent made a critical mistake. He dropped his guard instantly. The boy used the one move that the sensei taught him. He made the one move and to pin him. And the boy won the match that day, won the tournament. He was the champion. On the way home, the boy and the sensei reviewed every move in every match that he had won. And then the boy summoned the courage to ask what was really on his mind. He said, Sensi, how did I win the tournament with only one move? The master responded by saying, you won for two reasons. First, you almost mastered one of the most difficult throws in all of judo. And secondly, the only known defense for that move is for your opponent to grab your left arm. The boy's biggest weakness had become his biggest strength because his roots went down as he mastered that one single technique. Indifferent, impulsive hearts. My friends, we need deep roots, don't we? The parable goes on and talks about the third type of soil. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. The thorns and weeds here may have been cut down to the ground at ground level, but the roots, guess what? The roots were still there. Do you ever have a problem with dandelions in your lawn? I'm never successful in getting those things out. I try my best. I try to get all the weed killers and follow the, the principles and the methods. But still, somehow, there are weeds that still try to come up. The Bible mentions, what are these thorns? Now, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word of God and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Worldliness. The world and riches choking out the word of God. The word repent actually means to turn. To turn from something. And what are we to turn away from, my friends? Turn away from sin. And as we turn away from sin, we are headed toward Jesus Christ. Turning from something to turn to someone. But we need to pull the weeds. What do you say? The weeds of worldliness in our own lives. Lives that have divided hearts. Like the heart of the girl to which a young man once proposed. He said, darling. I know that you know, you know that I love you more than anything else in the world. I want you to marry me. I'm not rich. I don't have a yacht. I don't have a Rolls Royce like Johnny Brown does. But I love you with all my heart. She thought for a moment and said, I love you also with all my heart. But tell me more about Johnny Brown. 
My friends, when you and I know, and it's in our hearts, to follow Jesus Christ, when we have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me and the what? Cross before me. The fourth type of soil. But others fell, fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. What is this kind of heart? This is the heart who receives seed on the good ground, is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The heart that humbly receives the word of truth in genuine repentance, in genuine faith. And so in conclusion this morning, I would like to ask this question. What kind of ground are you? What kind of soil are you? If you are one of the three types of soil, the good news is you don't have to stay that way. Isn't that good news? Make sure that you have a fertile heart. Ask God to stir up the soil to turn the layers of your life over to him. And if you really want to have a truly spiritual and productive life, then plow the soil, prepare the heart to receive God's word, put down the roots and persevere through the trials of life, through the difficulties of life, for they will ultimately come. For all who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution, the Bible says. Through the trials of life, pursue, pull the weeds of worldly wealth, and pursue those spiritual riches. If you do those things, you will have good soil and the seed of God's word will produce a bountiful harvest in your life. The sower is Jesus. He wants to plant the seed of his word in our hearts. But we need to understand that at that time, a sevenfold harvest was considered a good harvest. A sevenfold fold harvest, fold harvest was a good harvest. But what does it say here? You might have a thirtyfold harvest, a sixtyfold harvest, a one hundredfold harvest, which is not an ordinary harvest, it is an extraordinary harvest. It's a miraculous harvest. It's a harvest that is life transforming and life changing and life altering and life redirecting. It's a life that God wants you to have as we give him our heart. Will you stand and join me in singing in closing hymn number 64, Lord dismiss us with thy blessing, 64.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being the divine sower who never gives up on us.